Okay, so last time we started uh, having a look at how stuff would bump into each other. So look at coagulation. And uh, we did that with uh, Smolikovsky and we were, we were halfway in it and then we ran out of time. So uh, let's uh, recap what we had. So we had a, a system of monodispersed spheres. The reason why monodispersed is otherwise it gets a bit complicated to model. And what we're interested in is the onset of collision, which basically means when two spheres bump into each other and they stick to each other and they form a dimer. That, that event is the onset of a coagulation event in this particular case. Coagulation meant that particles would aggregate irreversibly. Flocculation would mean that particles aggregate in a reversible manner. And coalescence, obviously, uh, would mean that if you, instead of, if you would have two solid particles, you have two particles that can deform, for example, two liquid droplets, and they bump into each other and they merge into a larger droplet. So that event would be coalescence, or you can even call it fusion, if you would like to um, use a different term for this. So, and then the kinetics for fast coagulation, so standard collision theory, would mean that if you bump, you stick. So there is no barrier. So the success rate, if you hit the central particle, success rate is 100% from sticking. Yeah? So and how, how did we try to solve this, or how did Smolikovsky solve this in uh, 1917? Well, he made use of the Fickian diffusion, uh, which is the equation at the top. So you have a flux, which is minus the diffusion coefficient times the gradient. And in a, in a spherical system, so spherical coordinates, you have a dnDr, with n being the number of particles per liter, and r being a, a measure for the radius, in this case, just a measure for distance. And we saw if we wanted to um, calculate well, no, the total flow of, of collision frequency of particles with a central sphere, you have to multiply that with an area. And the area of a sphere that would obviously we had to integrate over that it became bigger, bigger, bigger. So that's the purple uh, object there. Obviously the area of four pi r squared of a spherical object. So you multiply by that. So you got minus four pi r to the power two times the diffusion coefficient times the gradient. Yeah. And then an important thing was that we had to realize that the central particle wasn't sitting still. It moved as well. And only because both particles are exactly the same size and therefore have the same diffusion coefficient, we can say that D in this equation is twice, so it's D1 plus D1, yeah? If the central particle would have been bigger, then it would be D1 plus the diffusion coefficient of the central particle, call it D2, yeah? In this case, because they're the same size, D1 plus D1 is two times D1, yeah? So, so you fill that out, and then you separate the variables, and then you get this, uh, well, differential kind of equation over there. And then we had to integrate with the boundary conditions, and that's where we stopped last time. So on the right-hand side, obviously, from zero to n particles, because effectively you're, you're integrating from nothing on, on the edge of the central sphere, make your volume bigger and bigger and bigger, bigger, and the end result is that you capture everything. So you go from zero to... To, uh, to n. And then the other uh, term runs from 2a to infinity. And why 2a? Well, they can't interpenetrate each other. So if they touch each other, the distance between the central points of two spheres would be the radius plus the radius, and the radius was defined as little a. So that's why it's 2a. Yeah? So you integrate this thing, and then you get the equation below. So you get aj equals you know, minus 16 times pi times little a, which was the radius of the sphere, times d1 times n, which is the frequency of collision of all particles with the central sphere. Yeah? Now, remember that the collision theory initially was uh, a bimolecular or a biparticle process. Yeah, and that the overall equation as a function of time, so the number of one MERS, individual particles, N1, DT, 
would vary initially minus k times n1 to the power 2, because you have a bimolecular collision. Yeah, so this is only the onset of dimer formation. So the equation we have on the left, aj equals something, that one is only valid for the central particle. So to make this valid for all particles, we simply have to multiply with the number of particles. So you basically get n to the power 2 in the left-hand side too, which effectively means that k equals 16 times pi times a times d1. So that is your rate coefficient for bimolecular collision, so to speak. So, and that's k fast. And why do I, re why do I call this k fast? Because there is no barrier for collision. So if they bump into each other, by definition, they would stick. And this, this thing exactly would, would match um, just Brownian diffusional rate coefficients for bimolecular reactions. So you can try this out for yourself, right? So you can K diffusion for a bimolecular reaction in solution. This is just chemistry. Yeah, so for example, take a methyl radical, which you model as a sphere, and you take another, and, you, and you're interested in how a methyl radical reacts with a methyl radical. Yeah? That's an, a diffusion control process. So the chemistry, two radicals, they terminate with each other really quickly. Yeah? So K chem is very high. And K diffusion, if K diffusion is a few factors less than K chem, then that determines the overall rate. That's the rate determining step, basically. So if you would fill those numbers in, the fusion coefficients of, of uh, a radical of a methane radical, is, it might be hard to look up. But you can, for example, just look up the diffusion coefficient or the self-diffusion coefficient of methane dissolved in a solvent. And if, for example, you can measure that with dozy NMR. So you can, if you go into the literature, you put, a, you put a number in there, D1 plus D2, and then you need to know the size of a methane kind of molecule. So you can figure that out. You know roughly what a, a carbon-hydrogen bond length is. So you put that number in. You know the number of avocado. Typically, what you'll come up with is a number that's roughly something to the power 9, 10 to the power 9. Yeah? That's the fastest reaction, the fastest bimolecular reaction in an ordinary solvent. You cannot find a faster reaction. You can do your best, but you won't find one. If you find one, they've modeled it wrong. Yeah? The only solvent that could lift it to 10 to the power 10 might be supercritical CO2, because obviously, under supercritical conditions, viscosity drops a lot or is effectively zero. So, um, so then you can go higher. But check it, and simply by you know, fast reactions, this is really important, also for organic chemistry. And obviously, for particles, it's exactly the same equation. So now there's an interesting question. And, and so people start doing these experiments. And you can, for example, with light scattering, you can see when two particles touch each other. And uh, you know, someone said, that the rate coefficient for fast coagulation is independent of particle size. Is that true? Or is that not true? So um, think about this. So you have this equation, 16 times pi times the radius of the particle times the diffusion coefficient of the particle is k independent of the size, yes or no? So the, the way to solve this is, what's the expression for d? What's the expression you have to use for the diffusion coefficient? Self-diffusion coefficient is modeled with, with whom? Who came up with that equation in 1906? Einstein. And what? So the Stokes-Einstein equation says, D equals KT divided by 6 times pi times the viscosity of the medium times the radius of the particle. And if you put that in, radius over radius cancels out, which means that the coagulation rate is independent of particle size. So there you go. You put the equation in. And what you're left with is that K fast equals 8 times the Boltzmann constant times uh, the temperature divided by three times the viscosity of the medium. So it doesn't matter how big your particles are. If you're in a gravity-free regime and you can rely on Brownian diffusion, 
the rate of coagulation is the same. So now the question obviously is, how fast is this then? Yeah, and you can fill out the numbers. So you have to go back to year one kinetics in order to get an idea of this. So the original bit, you know, as a function of time, I had the number of single particles, which I called N1, so N2 would be the dimer, yeah? So the rate of production of that, so the variation, dN1, dT equals obviously negative because they get consumed because they bump into each other. So it's minus this rate coefficient times N1 to the power 2 because it's a bimolecular event or a biparticle event, yeah? And this you can just integrate, hopefully still, because he's had this in, was it year one, term two or something, uh, kinetics. So you have a second order kinetics, and you basically get one over N1 at time is T, minus one over N1 at time is zero, equals K fast times time, yeah? And then obviously for the half-life, you can figure out that T a half. So a half-life would mean that the time it takes that 50% of your particles have turned into dimers, yeah, so let's just assume that dimers not form trimers, etc. Yeah, so just look at the onset. The half-life, in order to put a time to that, is 1 over k fast times the original concentration of the particles. Now, if you would, would bump in some numbers for this, so we've just seen, you know, how to calculate k fast, and the total number of particles in a, in an, a, you know, if you would have a dispersion, typically is a number anywhere between 10 to the power 15 to 10 to the power 20. So if you put those numbers in, typically you'll get stability numbers of milliseconds. So this would mean that any colloidal uh, dispersion or any, any mini emulsion or something, as a result of Brownian motion and as a result of Brownian collision, would destabilize in a few milliseconds. Obviously, that's not the case. The case is that you know we can, you can, you can still have uh, systems that are stable for years and years and years. So, and the result, the only reason why, is because there is a repulsive barrier in place. So, I would like to collide, but I won't collide because if I come close, there's a repulsive interaction between the two particles, and as a result of that, they move apart from each other. So you don't have a you know full frontal hit, and you don't have uh, coagulation in that particular case. So, so this is what we've seen. Like so, colloids, lyophobic colloids, they're thermodynamically metastable, so they have the tendency to flocculate, coagulate, or collapse. Yeah, and and based on Brownian diffusion, we had this half-life. And k fast is expressed as a times k times t times 3 over the viscosity. And uh, in this case, I used air task viscosity. Obviously, we used the symbol mu before, but you know you can interchange those. Uh, and then, you know, what is this barrier? And we saw in the previous lecture, we talked about it quantitatively, that you could put charge on a particle. So you have a negative particle and negative particle. When they close, you have columbic repulsion. Yeah, and in a in a in a colloid kind of way, if you're in high dielectric media, such as water, you have double layer interaction, and as a result of that, you get repulsion. And the other thing would be steric stabilization. So you have a hairy particle, and when they come close, the hairs interpenetrate, and as a result of that, you get a rise in osmotic pressure, which soaks in water, pushes the particles away. And on top of that, you have an entropic effect, because these, these chains enter tangle, and they don't like that, so they want to maintain their mobility. And as a result of that, they move apart. Uh, uh, as, as a result of that, they move apart as well, and then you have an elastic contribution on top of the change as well. So those type of things can be put in place. So one of the guys that was first to realize this was uh, was Fuchs, and he put uh, a parameter in there. But before you kind of notice, you know, the question, the ultimate question to ask is, how high should this barrier be? Yeah. I have two particles that move at a certain velocity. The ballistic velocity is half mv squared equals half kt in one dimension. Yeah. So how high should this barrier be? So this is an exercise. 
So the question in this case is, consider a 10 weight percent monodispersed polymer latex in water with a particles of 100 nanometer in diameter at a polymer density of 1100 kilograms per cubic meter. A crude estimate for the energy barrier needed to keep the latex stable for one year. So what is the barrier, the energy barrier that I need to get on my particles so that these things, when they co don't collide, basically, you don't get a single collision for a year. Now that obviously is a, is a nasty question to ask, but you know, you, you could just ask it like that. So I've given you eight hints on how to solve it. So here are the eight hints. So I suggest uh, let's have a go at this and see whether you can crack it. So you obviously, you just, you work your way through number one, then to number two, then to number three, four, five, six, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'll end up with the solution. So hints are given and hopefully uh, you'll be able to, uh, to do this. You can work together, right? You don't have to do it on your own. So.